about him, but let's get started on the 14th Amendment because there's just so much to do. So welcome everybody. Excited to have you all in class today. Happy 14th Amendment a day. I think I said fourth earlier. It's the 14th Amendment day. Today, we're going to talk about the 14th Amendment, why we needed the 14th Amendment, how we've used it in our history of America, and the big word incorporation. We'll dive into that as well. So, so much to do, so little time, so many cases, so many stories. My name is Curry Sautner. As we go through class today, if you have any questions, any shares, please feel free to put them in the chat and we will make sure to address them. And we are very lucky today because we are here with Tom Donnelly, one of our top scholars who loves the 14th Amendment and is bursting at the seams right now to walk us through the history. So Tom, any kind of big idea you wanna start and kick us off with around the 14th Amendment and then we're gonna dive in quickly. Absolutely, no, the, the 14th Amendment in so many ways is at the center of so many of the constitutional debates that we care about today. It has, it has a rich history, a relevant present, so I love talking about it. It is a fun one. and so. So the 14th Amendment, and you, you've taught me this, and it like really mesmerizes me, and I feel like we could hear it over and over again. What does the 14th Amendment, and we'll read the words directly, but what does the 14th Amendment do for our Constitution? How does it transform it and change it? And how does it kind of embrace our values in our country? Sure, so the 14th Amendment, it's ratified after the Civil War in 1868. And the way I always like to think about it, Curry, is that it wrote the Declaration of Independence's promise of freedom and equality into our Constitution. It really transformed the Constitution, it's, its very text, forever. And many scholars, I think, rightly think of it as part of our nation's second founding. It's this period after the Civil War where we're trying to set a new foundation for America, saying we don't want to go back to Jim Crow, we don't want to go back to slavery, we don't want to go back to secession and civil war, but we want a promise of freedom and equality for everyone. And it's so important to talk about this time period and the, you know, we're gonna start in this time period and move forward. But there was a report that came out not just in the last week about how reconstruction isn't taught well in the United States. So I think this class is unbelievably important. So give us a framing. You talked about the 14th Amendment being added in 18, excuse me, 1868. So could you just walk us through 13, 14th, and 15th real quick, and then we'll dive into the text of the 14th. Absolutely. So the 14th is part of this amazing trilogy of transformational amendments we add to the Constitution after the Civil War. And so they're all, like I said, they're meant to place the United States on a new constitutional foundation. The 13th Amendment ratified in 1865 abolishes slavery. The 14th Amendment ratified in 1868 promotes freedom and equality. And the 15th Amendment ratified in 1870 that promises to ban racial discrimination in voting. The big idea here that connects all three is that we want to eradicate slavery. And after the Civil War, we want to pro promise equal citizenship for African-Americans. So eradicating slavery, promote ensuring freedom and equality at the end of slavery, and then the right to vote for African-Americans. That's the big kind of original ideas and concepts into this 14th Amendment. So let's look at the words and you can show us where to find those big ideas, at least the 14th Amendment's big ideas of freedom and equality. Yeah, so this is this huge block of text. This is section one of the 14th Amendment. And for, for, for so many of the issues that we care about constitutionally, they're touched on right here in this text. It's a big block of text. I'm gonna read it in full though, because it's so important. The first sentence is, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. This is known as the citizenship clause. And then finally, that second sentence includes three big clauses, the privileges or immunities clause, the due process clause, and the equal protection clause. Here's the text. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Now, this is this can sound like technical language, Curry, but in many ways, the big ideas are pretty simple. Should we quickly walk through them before we get to the story of the 14th Amendment? Yes, because you are the first professor I have ever met that breaks it down this clearly. So break it down for our students into the big ideas. Yeah, so there are four big features to the 14th Amendment. These are the four ways in which this key text transforms the Constitution forever. The first big idea is birthright citizenship. 
And so here the idea is Dred Scott v. Sanford is wrong, it's overturned. African Americans did have rights which the white man was bound to respect. And if you're born on American soil, you're an American citizen. In that single sentence, that first sentence of the 14th Amendment, the Reconstruction founders write into the Constitution lessons that say, we are not going back to slavery, we are not going back to Dred Scott, we are starting anew here in post-Civil War America. So that's birthright citizenship. Equality. The next one is equality. And here, it's, it's easy to forget that the original Constitution, that 1787 document that we all revere, it was silent on the Declaration of Independence's promise of equality with the 14th Amendment and its Equal Protection Clause. We finally write that protection into the Constitution. And that's that last part you see there, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. That's birthright citizenship, equality. The third big idea is freedom. And so here it's important to remember that the original Bill of Rights, when it was ratified, it only applied to the national government. So those protections of free speech, religious liberty, the right to keep and bear arms, it only applied when the national government violated those rights. But with the 14th Amendment, the Constitution now protects those abuses when the states abuse, when the, it protects those rights when the states abuse them. So if your governor, if your state legislature, if a police officer violates a key Bill of Rights protection like speech, religious liberty, the right against unreasonable searches and seizures, those, the Bill of Rights now applies against those abuses. That is known as the, the, big, the big word for this is incorporation. So that's birthright citizenship, equality, freedom. The last big idea is a national protection of civil rights. And so this is section five of the 14th Amendment, giving Congress new powers to protect to protect all of the rights that we're finding here in the 14th Amendment. The language is the Congress shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. And here Congress is now given more power than it had before. So the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments are the first amendments of the Constitution that give the national government more power. And so it's rebalancing the relationship between the national government and the states, that traditional system of federalism. It doesn't mean that all the, all the power goes to the national government. We still debate what goes to the national government, what goes to the states, but this key provision ends up rebalancing the power, giving more power to the national government. And I like how you kind of weave that in there. So there's that, that enforcement clause in each one of these separately. So they added it in in every single one of them, but the one around the 14th Amendment is really like calling out to say, states as well, states as well, that it's, you know, shifting the power dynamic between the national government and the state's government. So in a way, when we think about this, we think about the original constitution being almost afraid of the national government and like, it's going to get too big, it's going to get too powerful. And the state governments are going to be the ones that protect the individuals. This is kind of rebalancing that and saying, okay, we're going to lean on the national government here and call you into the game to say your job is to protect the individuals. Is that a good way to summarize it? It is. I think what the framers here of the 14th Amendment and all of the Reconstruction Amendments, they're trying to learn one of the big lessons about the Civil War and pre-Civil War America. And that is that not only the national government abuses rights, abuses its power, but the state governments can too. And so we want to ensure that our, that our Constitution becomes a full charter of national freedom applying to both the national government and to state abuses. We trust no one. <laughs> I love that. I love that so much. It's not like, no, no, we trust the national government more. It's basically, we don't trust either of you anymore. Love that idea. So we're going to like tick through some of the big court cases and the people that fought to make these changes and to get the ideas of these words into the document. And we're also going to dive into the guy that wrote it. So do you want to start with birthright citizenship or would you like to start with Bingham? Let's just quickly talk about the author of this key language and then we can move to the various cases. Great, here he is. Okay, so this is John Bingham. He was a representative in the House of Representatives during Reconstruction, and he is the primary author of that language we just read, section one of the 14th Amendment. He was an amazing figure. He was an important anti-slavery voice in Congress. He, was a, he helped prosecute Lincoln's assassins. He gave the closing argument at President Andrew Johnson's impeachment trial. He became the ambassador to Japan, but for our purposes, he's most known as the primary author of section one of the 14th Amendment. The great Justice Hugo Black, one of the great justices of the 20th century, would later call John Bingham the 14th Amendment's James Madison. He may be a forgotten founder today, but in many ways, his importance to the Constitution couldn't be any, any greater. 
And so one of our charges for our students this week and every week is to spread the word about Bingham. And if he is the James Madison of the second founding, then maybe we should know about him as equally and as much as we know about Madison, James Madison. Um, so let's dive into the idea, the, that first sentence in the 14th Amendment and its job is to fix the wrongs of the Dred Scott case. So we can drive into the Dred Scott case and then look at this idea of birthright citizenship um, through the years. Sure, so the Dred Scott decision, it's before the Civil War, it's 1857. What the Supreme Court effectively says there is that African-Americans can't be United States citizens and that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. The 14th Amendment, that first sentence, the citizenship clause is right there saying crisply, clearly, Right at the beginning of the 14th Amendment, Supreme Court, Chief Justice Taney, who wrote Dred Scott, Dred Scott decision itself, you are wrong. You are wrong. African-Americans can be United States citizens. They do have rights which the white man was bound to respect. And America is committing itself to the idea of birthright citizenship. But debates over the citizenship clause, they haven't gone away. They were there you know, during, during the period right after the ratification of the 14th Amendment. One of the important early cases addressing the citizenship clause is United States versus Wang Kim, Kim Ark. This involves a, a Chinese American. And so Wang Kim Ark, he's born in San Francisco. His parents are Chinese citizens. And at age 21, he decides, I'm gonna, I'm gonna travel from the United States all the way back to China to visit my parents. They're back in China, of course, I wanna see them. So he visits, goes back to China, and then he comes back to the United States. And he tries to get back into the United States and the United States government says, no, you can't come back in. You're, he was denied entry. They said, you are not a United States citizen. So here's Wang Kim Ark, born on American soil, born in San Francisco to Chinese immigrant parents said, no, you are not a United States citizen. Wang Kim Ark says, I read my 14th amendment. I, I read the first sentence, the citizenship clause. Of, I was born on American soil. Of course, I'm a United States citizen. And the Supreme Court in a six to two decision written by Justice Horace Gray says, yes, Wang Kim Ark, you're right. You're right. In the end, it doesn't matter who your parents are. It matters where you're born. And so if you're born in American soil, even if you're born to citizens of another nation, you are a United States citizen. The Supreme Court says, you know, there are some small exceptions to this rule. There's this language in the 14th Amendment. It says, but subject to the jurisdiction thereof, it's an exception the citizenship clause, but the Supreme Court reads that exception very narrowly. It says it's really just meant to apply to a narrow band of people, to diplomats from other countries, say that have uh, sovereign immunity from the laws of the United States, or Native American tribes who have their own forms of tribal immunity. But anyone else, if you're someone like Wang Kim Ark, your parents may be from China, but if you're born here in the United States, you're a United States citizen. Awesome. And it's a, when you look at these cases, you can un see, and we're going to go through so many cases today, different people fighting for the rights and the values that we have in the 14th Amendment, calling for a 14th Amendment as well. So the next kind of big grouping that you had is around equality. And I will just tell the students now, some of these things, these cases overlap. Are they in freedom? Are they in quality? Are they birthright citizenship? They're not, it's not so perfectly clear cut. They're like a Venn diagram with overlapping. So diving into the equality kind of piece on it, you know, we can talk about Dred Scott as well, but we're really also kind of bring us to Muhammad's case that he wanted to know more about, which is Plessy versus Ferguson. Yeah, absolutely. So this promise of equality, it's written into the 14th Amendment. And, you know, it, it, the, the framers really meant it. So here's what John Bingham said about the 14th Amendment, his vision. He sought a, quote, simple, strong, plain declaration that the equal laws and equal and exact justice shall hereafter be secured within every state of the union, guaranteeing equal protection for any person, no matter whence he comes or how poor, how weak, how simple, no matter how friendless. So this is 1866, he says that. 1868, the 14th Amendment's ratified. And for a number of years, we really do experiment in multiracial democracy in America. This is the period of reconstruction. And for African-Americans, they really do participate greatly in American political life, civil life. We have African-Americans meeting in convention, laying out their visions for the constitution. We have African-Americans voting in massive numbers, electing Republicans in the South, pushing for the ratification of the 14th and 15th amendments. And we have African-Americans holding office at every level of government from U.S. Senator to U.S. House of Representatives to governors to state le legislature, all the way down to local sheriffs. And so we have this brief period, this shining moment of multiracial democracy, but it's all too brief. Pretty soon, the, you know, white Southerners retake control 
of governments throughout the South. They imposed Jim Crow segregation throughout the society, branding African-Americans as second-class citizens. This means they use a mix of intimidation, violence, Jim Crow laws to keep them from the ballot box and to treat them unfairly in a variety of contexts, separating out white Americans from African-Americans in schools, at water fountains, in hotels, in restaurants, you name it. And that brings us to Plessy v. Ferguson. So what happens there? It's 1896. You know, it's really, it's, 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 you know, three decades from the ratification of the 14th Amendment itself. And what does the Supreme Court say? Here we have, who is Homer Plessy first? Homer Plessy, he's an African-American from Louisiana. He's an activist in the community who works with an organization uh, that, that is looking to push back against Louisiana's system of segregation. And so they have this separate car act in Louisiana, which says that on railroad cars, passengers, white passengers and African-American passengers, they have to be in different cars. So it's just a classic form of Jim Crow segregation. And Homer Plessy brings this case as a test case. And he, what he argues is that, look, what's clearer than that something like this that treats African-Americans different from white Americans, that violates the equal protection of the laws. What could be a clearer violation of the 14th Amendment and its promise of equality? But the Supreme Court in, this, in a seven to one decision written by Justice Henry Billings Brown says, no, Mr. Plessy, you're wrong. This system of Jim Crow segregation, this system of separating white, white, white Americans from African-Americans, it's constitutional. It does not violate the 14th Amendment. Louisiana has the power to enact Jim Crow laws. And in the Supreme Court's view, it's consistent with Louisiana's power to promote the, promote the health, safety, and welfare of its citizens. And so there it's the Supreme Court green lighting Jim Crow segregation, but powerfully there's a dissent. It's seven to one. And the one that one that single dissenter is this man, Justice John Marshall Harlan. He writes one of the most powerful dissents in the history of the Supreme Court. And he says, Plessy Court, what in the world are you talking about? How can you look at this law and not see what it does? It violates the core of protection of equality in the 14th Amendment. Of course, it treats African-Americans as second-class citizens. And so what, what, what John Marshall Harlan says here is, you know, effectively, of course, it violates the 14th Amendment. So we have the Supreme Court's majority on one hand, seven justices saying Jim Crow segregation is constitutional and a single voice crying out in the desert saying no, of course it violates the 14th Amendment. And I think this is unbelievably powerful. And when, so often we look back at the past and say, did they just not know? Did they just not know that it was really unequal? And you can read this in that moment. And he's like, no, you guys know, you know exactly what you're doing. This is what this is laying out and setting up. Um, and you have people like Homer that were still willing to fight, take these test cases and try to prove that it wasn't living up to the intentions and the meaning and the goal of the 14th Amendment. So as we kind of walk through these cases and we look at moving forward, it takes a really long time to overturn Plessy. And what I think I love most about it is it's this little girl that helps to overturn the Plessy case and the ruling that separate but equal is constitutional. Yeah, it would take over half a century countless activists, countless lawyers fighting and fighting and fighting to finally overturn Plessy v. Ferguson. The key case is in many ways the most famous Supreme Court case ever, Brown versus Board of Education. It's 1954. It's brought by Linda Brown. She's a third grader. What does she want? She and her parents, she just want, they, they want to just be able to attend their local school, the Sumner School in Topeka, Kansas. And the local school officials say no. They say no, this school is only for white students African-Americans are not allowed. And by the way, the Supreme Court said that this was okay in Plessy v. Ferguson. But Linda Brown and her parents say no. They say Plessy was wrong the day it was decided. Jim Crow segregation in the schools and more broadly violates the 14th Amendment's promise of equality. And the Supreme Court, a unanimous Supreme Court says, Linda Brown, Linda Brown's parents, you are right. We, the Supreme Court and Plessy v. Ferguson, we were wrong. Plessy was wrong the day it was decided in Brown versus Board of Education in, an, in, in a unanimous opinion authored by Chief Justice Earl Warren, says that Plessy is overturned. Jim Crow segregation is unconstitutional. And then here's the key language here from Chief Justice Warren. We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Brown itself was a thunderbolt striking at the very heart of Jim Crow segregation in the schools, but the battle would continue. What we'd see that we'd see 10, you know, a, a decade later in 1964, Congress would pass an important law, the Civil Rights Act, 
1964, promote, promoting equality in a variety of settings. Uh, it would pass the Voting Rights Act of 1965, promising political equality to African-Americans. And then finally in 1967, the Supreme Court itself would get back in on the action and strike down laws banning interracial marriage in Loving v. Virginia. These were laws that said that white Americans and African-Americans, they couldn't marry. The Supreme Court said, that's nonsense. That's wrong. It violates the 14th Amendment. And it, I love this to watch this kind of tick through. It feels like it takes forever and then it starts to like chip away quicker and quicker. One thing that Colin pointed out in the chat and I forgot in this class and last class, Homer Plessy, which we do not have a photo of. Our team has been searching for years to find a photo of. Um, there is r really hard to find a, an image of Homer Plessy. Just last, was it two weeks ago? Just two weeks ago, Louisiana governor pardoned Homer Plessy because he was arrested for going into the wrong cart. And those charges because of the Supreme Court were applied to him. So you wanna just take a beat on that um, reversal and a uh, pardon? You know, it's, 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 it's just a reminder of how much these things reverberate over time and how they remain, you know, sort of live sources of conversation and important history to know. It's so important and also a little shocking that he just got pardoned, but a really, really important speech from the governor of Louisiana. And it was on the train station platform where oh, Homer gosh. took his, I thought it was super cool. I love place. When we talk about history, place is so important. And I thought it was cool that they chose that train station platform to show that heroic act of Homer Plessy by testing the system and trying to make the constitution work the way it's supposed to. Now there's other groups that looked to the 14th Amendment and utilized it to say, no, equality and freedom are for all of us. So can we take a, it's not a sidebar, but it's a loop around the story of equality and do a couple of beats on gender equality. Yeah, of course. So the 14th Amendment, it's, it's paradigm case. The key case it was meant to apply to was discrimination against African-Americans. But the language of the 14th Amendment is quite broad. It calls for the equal protection of the laws. It says nothing about race. John Bingham himself, fought hard for that broad language, that broad protection to be in there. So as early as the 1870s, right after the ratification of the 14th Amendment, women began to lay claim to the 14th Amendment. Powerful women like Virginia Minor, Mira Bradwell, they argue the 14th Amendment, it applies to us. We should have equal protection of the laws. Mira Bradwell goes to the Supreme Court and argues, I have a right to practice law. And Virginia Minor goes to the Supreme Court and says, I have the right to vote as a privilege or immunity of American citizenship. But in these important cases of, 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 of uh, Bradwell versus Illinois and Minor v. Hackersett, the Supreme Court says no. The Supreme Court says the 14th Amendment's protections do not apply to women in this case. Justice, just, just, Justice Joseph P. Bradley in the Bradwell decision wrote a concurrence and here just gives you a flavor of his reasoning in this case. He said the paramount destiny and mission of women are to fill the noble and benign offices of wife and mother. This is the law of the creator. It's one of the most infamous concurrences in the history of the Supreme Court. But eventually, Mira Bradley, uh, uh, Bradwell and uh, at Virginia Minor, they would win out. Because by 1970, the Supreme Court finally says, you were right. You were right. The 14th Amendment does apply to women's rights. And here, the crusading lawyer is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the future justice. So beginning in the 1970s, she brings a series of cases in the courts eventually to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court says, yes. The 14th Amendment, yes, it applies to racial discrimination, but its protections of equality also extend to women. And once Justice Ginsburg ends up on the Supreme Court, she authors a landmark decision in Virginia versus United States known as the BMI case in 1996. It was a challenge to the Virginia Military Academy's policy of admitting only male cadets. And the Supreme Court struck down this policy in an opinion by Justice Ginsburg. Here's a little flavor of her opinion there. Justice Ginsburg reminded us sex classifications may not be used as they once were to create or perpetuate the legal, social, and economic inferiority of women. If Virginia wants to put a policy like this in place, it needs a, quote, exceedingly persuasive justification. It, that range of emotions I have during this part of this class is very strong. <laughs> From the words of that case to these words, it's horror and triumph all in the same time. Okay, we are ticking through this. Okay, let's go to, we're gonna go to freedom and then incorporation. We can do it, Tom. Yeah, so the last, the last key uh, uh, principle we're going to touch on today is the 14th Amendment's protection of freedom. And so this was really central to John Bingham's vision for the 14th Amendment. And it's a very big deal. 
Because remember, as we said at the beginning, when the founding generation ratified the Bill of Rights, it only applied to abuses by the national government. And then in 1833, in a landmark decision known as Barron v. Baltimore, authored by Chief Justice John Marshall, he confirmed this understanding that Bill of Rights is only going to, going to apply if the national government abuses your rights. The states, they are not touched by the original Bill of Rights. So this meant if your home state, in my case, the state of New Jersey, punished you for criticizing your governor, the First Amendment wouldn't protect you before the ratification of the 14th Amendment. Your state constitution might, but the national constitution didn't. And before the Civil War, many Southern states would abuse a number of key Bill of Rights protections, in many cases, uh, banning abolitionist speech throughout the South, abolitionist writing, abolitionist preaching. And so for John Bingham and the Republican Party after the Civil War, part of their vision was to ensure that the core protections of the Bill of Rights, they apply to state abuses. Because again, as Curry mentioned at the beginning of class, one of the key lessons of the pre-Civil War period and the Civil War itself is that states can abuse rights too. And so we need the constitution to be able to reach abuses by state governments. In the context of the Bill of Rights, the big word here is incorporation. And so this is where key Bill of Rights protections like free speech, they're going to apply as much to the president and Congress as they do to the governor and the state legislature. The incorporation really turns, incorporation in the 14th Amendment really turned the Bill of Rights for the first time into a charter of national freedom, one that applies to all levels of government, national, state, and local with equal force. Now, as we talk about the story of incorporation, Curry, one thing to note is that the Supreme Court initially rejects the idea of incorporation. So the Supreme Court in the 1870s, 1880s, all the way up into the 20th century, reads the 14th Amendment's protection of freedom narrowly in the context of Bill of Rights protections. It, it, it read it narrowly in cases like the Slaughterhouse cases, in cases like United States versus Cruikshank. And so we end up with a, with a, a 14th Amendment at the end of the 1800s that doesn't really match up with John Bingham's vision of this broad national charter of freedom. But as we get into the 20th century, this changes. And so what we see is a process of what's known as selective incorporation. So the Supreme Court takes a series of challenges from different people challenging state and local laws that violate key Bill of Rights protections. So things like free speech, religious liberty, the right to uh, against unreasonable searches and seizures, the right to a jury trial, all of these key protections in the Bill of Rights, challengers are bringing cases to court saying, in the end, these sorts of protections, they don't just apply to the national government, but with the 14th Amendment, they should apply to the states. And beginning in earnest in 1925 in a case called Gitlow, the Supreme Court begins to agree. And so over time from 1925 onward, the Supreme Court incorporates right after right, ticking through the different rights in the Bill of Rights, incorporating them against the states, having the Bill of Rights extend then from not just the national government to a variety of state abuses. And this process really picks up in the 1950s and 60s under the leadership of Chief, Chief Justice Earl Warren and the great intellectual pioneer of incorporation on the court, Justice Hugo Black. And what I love about this story, Curry, is it's still going on. Just in the last few years, the court has continued to incorporate additional rights. In the McDonald case, it incorporated the Second Amendment's protection to uh, a right to keep and bear arms against the state. So this is McDonald versus City of Chicago in 2010. But just in the last couple of years, the Supreme Court has also extended incorporation to cover the Sixth Amendment's protection of unanimous jury trials, and then also the Eighth Amendment's protection against excessive fines. And so over time, the Supreme Court has incorporated nearly every right in the Bill of Rights. The only ones that it hasn't are the Third Amendment's protection against quartering troops, the Fifth Amendment's grand jury right, and the Seventh Amendment's civil jury right. You know, as the court does this, Curry, they do it using the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, but I wouldn't really get too, too bogged down in the legal jargon here. The big idea is that the 14th Amendment applies key Bill of Rights protections like free speech and religious liberty and, and uh, religious liberty to state abuses. It turns the Bill of Rights into a charter of national freedom. And I think that's so unbelievably powerful. So we have about one minute left. And what I thought would be really interesting, Tom, is and you kind of alluded to this, and we've talked about it before, how these cases are still can be still split decisions. And whose power is it, the national governments or the states' governments, to make change under equality? But what I thought would be cool, since this is our advanced class, what are the cases that we should be paying attention to coming up in the court right now and that will be coming down in June and July that our students should be looking for and reading into? 
that are around this idea of the 14th Amendment or incorporation? Yeah, so I mean, the, the, uh, it, there's, there's, you know, uh, I'd say the two really big ones, Curry, you know, one, one addresses, you know, the important issue that we didn't really get to of substantive due process and unenumerated rights. So there's a case called Dobbs before the Supreme Court this term, that is a direct challenge to Roe versus Wade and the right to reproductive choice. And so what the Supreme Court has to do there, it has to do two separate things. One, it has to engage with the substantive question of whether or not the 14th Amendment protects the right to an abortion, even though that particular right is not written specifically into the Constitution. So it's this question of what rights that aren't specifically listed in the Constitution are still protected by the 14th Amendment. The Supreme Court for over a century has, had there, has said there are certain rights like this, rights like the right to privacy more broadly, which we get from Griswold versus Connecticut. But the Supreme Court in that case, Dobbs, is gonna to have to ask whether or not the 14th Amendment protects a right to an abortion. Part of the question there too, Curry, though, is, okay, even if you, did, even if you, you say that the 14th Amendment does not protect abortion rights, how much should precedent matter? And so you could believe that as an original matter, Roe was wrong, but still believe that Roe should be upheld because it's been the law for so long based on Supreme Court case law. So Dobbs is sort of this big case that's dealing with Roe versus Wade, the future of abortion rights under the 14th Amendment. And, you know, it's, it's one that will probably get the opinion, I would imagine, all the way at the end of the term. So right at the end of June is probably when we'll see the result in that one. The other thing is there is a, a, a Second Amendment case before the Supreme Court this year that's challenging a New York law that has to do with uh, the carry of guns outside of the home. And so on the one hand, we may think of this as a Bill of Rights case, it's a Second Amendment case, but because of incorporation, because of the 14th Amendment, it's really a 14th Amendment case. The only reason the Second Amendment can be used to attack a law by the state of New York is because of the 14th Amendment, because of incorporation. So that's another one. So that it, it, with Dobbs, we see a big, unenumerated rights case dealing with reproductive rights and with the New York gun case, we see a big incorporation case dealing with the meaning of the Second Amendment. Oh, thank you, Tom. That's fun to kind of see what we're looking for. So a question around <clears throat> colleges that came in early. Um, the, one of the students asked, how come there can be female colleges, female only colleges, and you don't see a male only college? And you know, what I've seen, of, uh, you know, across the country is that there were male only colleges and they have been slowly changing. Um, but can you kind of, are there any key cases that were fighting that balance at the college level? I mean, we know that Brown versus Board of Ed, that string of cases that led to Brown versus Board of Ed, they began by attacking the colleges and the law schools and saying there's no way the college could have a separate but equal facility. Therefore, it was impossible, unconstitutional, not happen. But any other cases that you can think of that worked, looked at gender? I mean, the Virginia case, I think, is a great example of one, but any others? Yeah, the Virginia one is the big one that comes to mind. One thing to note is that a lot of the a lot of the schools that that are single gender schools are private schools. So the the Fourteenth Amendment itself would not necessarily directly address them. But I mean, if you're looking at the question in any context of a, a school that is only going to have um, you know one particular gender, the key question is going to be you know is there under VMI an exceedingly persuasive reason for that school for for that school to exist? as a single gender school. And so the schools, so the state, the school is gonna to have to make an argument under the 14th Amendment based on that particular doctrinal rule. So the, maybe, the, maybe the state might have an argument, maybe it won't, but that's, that's the framework. The framework is with the 14th Amendment, a challenger could come into court, challenge the existence of a single gender school. And then the state, the school is gonna to have to come back and say, I have this exceedingly persuasive reason for keeping this school single gender. And the court has to decide yes or no, whether or not that's actually exceedingly persuasive. Thank you. And that is such a good point to part out and point out and remind all of us that this is really also looking at public schools and what area can the government have an influence? What area can the government kind of be a part of this? Uh, and where does the Constitution apply and where does it not apply? I think uh, quite often with, you know, I gave the example of Drexel University, the university that I got my doctorate in was an all male school until like the, the late 30s to 40s. And one of the reasons why they shifted was also because of the fact that they wanted female students because that increased their student population and that gave them more students. So looking at all these kind of ways and effect change and that people were no longer going there because it was a male only school. So people can have ways to affect those 
um, schools that don't apply in that area. Really good questions on that front. And then I think we have one more question and I'm sorry for the ridiculousness on my side, we were losing power in here. Um, so in what ways do states still violate due process? Do we see ways, um, so this is Eric asked in the Q&A, in what ways do, do states still violate due process? Is there something connected to like uh, administrative law in medical boards, divorce courts? The, there's a couple examples in here for you as well. Any, any examples or ideas that you can think of on that front? Yeah, I mean, most of those challenges are in the administrative law context. And so the way the Supreme Court deals with what's called, so what's called procedural due process is when we deal with procedure under the due process clause. And so basically what the Supreme Court has put in place is a framework where there's, there's sort of a bare minimum of process that's due in certain government settings. It's not like a, it's not like a firm set of things, but things like you have to have, you know, an opportunity, you have to have notice that, you, you know, notice to when you're supposed to appear, you have to have the opportunity to be heard. There's sort of minimal uh, procedural protections in a variety of contexts. And so challengers can, in the context of whether it's a benefits hearing or, you know, some other administrative setting, can bring the 14th Amendment's procedural due process protections to bear in that context. Effectively, we're just arguing that the procedure that the government's put in place in this context is unfair for, you know, a variety of reasons. Awesome. And then one other question, Eric's is just using this Q&A very well. Um, so has gender equality under the law adapted um, to differences in bo uh, boys' um, maturation and needs, like so maturity of boys? And the only thing that popped into my head was actually the change in our society depend depending on how people mature. So this, uh, the example I popped into my head was that boys were a huge aspect of the Civil War and they were a lot younger. So when we think of soldiers going to war, um, there were young boys in the Civil War, 12 years old, 14 year olds, 15 year olds. And it was almost like the reverse that it was, it became older and older. So is there anything that we can see kind of that equality under the law change because of the way society deems um, age of a gender? And then also the other example is, you know, how, how it changed for women so drastically, depending on how we see women as well. Yeah, I can't think of anything, you know, directly relevant today. I mean, it does remind me of one of the cases that, that uh, Justice Ginsburg uh, brought as a lawyer called uh, Craig versus Boren back in the 18, uh, 18. See, Curry, you said you turned called the Sorry. 1800s, the 1900s. I do the reverse. But in the <laughs> 1970s, where she challenged an Oklahoma law that treated men and women differently uh, in terms of alcohol age. And so, and, and so it was because, in part because I think men were seen as less responsible. Men had to be 21 in order to buy alcohol. Women only had to be 18. And the Supreme Court struck that down, saying that, that violates the protection of sex equality in the 14th Amendment. In this case, it, it violated the rights of men. Um, but it, it sort of said that Oklahoma, that wasn't a good enough reason to provide a different rule for alcohol ages for men and for women. And now a couple other people are sharing like, oh, around voting ages, but also around, and Corey, great, great point on this one, um, giving minors the death penalty and being charged as adults. And that's pretty interesting too, looking at the equality of, of the law being charged to you, depending on your age and depending on your IQ as well. I know that is a big conversation around um, the Eighth Amendment and is that connected to incorporation? Sorry, we are going down a rabbit hole, but it's really interesting, Tom, so we're there. <laughs> well, it's an Eighth Amendment case. Those cases, they, they death penalty cases tend to deal with state laws. And because of that, it's a 14th Amendment incorporation case. Great, awesome, very good. The okay. answer is all, almost always yes. No, it's in there. It's right, Goo. Uh, thank you, Tom, so much. This was a great class. Thank you for kind of leading us with what to look for around the 14th Amendment. And I'm going to just stop and pause the recording. But students, if you have more questions and these are going in, keep them coming. I'm going to come back to the questions and we're going to continue to grill Tom because that's what we love to do. So let me just pause for